Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials. Hello, everyone. This is Marcus Grody, your host for this program. This is Deep in Scripture, and we're coming to you from the studios of the Coming Home Network International. I'm joined today by my compatriot, Ken Hensley. As I've said in the past, I'm coming to you from the heart of it all, Ohio, and Ken's coming to you (laughs) from the left of it all out in California. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Hello, Ken. How are you doing out there, Ken? Oh, I'm doing great. It's about 70 degrees today. Warm, uh, sun shining. It's it's all right out here. I know that you uh, said you got there. There there are some positives. There are some positives (laughs) to being on the on the left coast. (laughs) Well, I know you were saying that you were uh, having some coughs that you were dealing with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm well. I feel great, but I continue to cough. So I apologize in advance if I have to, like, cover my mouth and hack once in a while. Um, well, as long as you're way over there on the West Coast, uh, you're closer to China than we are here in Ohio. So I, I'm hoping you haven't picked up something. No, it's not the corona. It's not the coronavirus. All right, my friend. <laughs> Uh, here we are being with levity, and it's funny, but given the we're going to be studying change, we're, we're, we're being uh, showing levity with at the same time we're doing that around the world. There are people that are in horrendous trials facing coronavirus and that. So we've got to be careful in our levity, but okay, let's let's yeah. talk about that and facing trials. Now we're we're beginning our study, continuing our study, excuse me, of James um, and uh, as we mentioned in the past, uh, the book of James uh, is one of those books that has had a controversy, if you will, throughout the history of the church. It's not always been as popular on the lists of readings for Christians. Christians tend to turn to the mm-hmm. the books of Paul, uh, maybe the books of Peter, and especially the the books written by John. But the book of James, as well as the book of Hebrews, doesn't get as much press as the rest of the New Testament books can. Mm-hmm. And you looking back mm-hmm. on your background as a, pres- mm-hmm. uh, as a pastor, and I was a Presbyterian, but you were Baptist, uh, both of us from a, a Reformed Calvinist background, uh, you know, James and Hebrews were not as popular. Exactly right. Yeah. I mean, although when I think back on it, I preached through both James and Hebrews as a Protestant minister, but you're right. They're not as popular. And why do you think that's that's so? Well, I, we'll talk about that, I think, in, oh, okay. our, in our discussion today. I opened the program with that initial verse that we're going to look at. And it just when you, if you really think about that verse, you may have some idea on why this book uh, was awkward for some people because the, the section we're going to look at today is chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Let me read that. And he begins, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials. For you know that the testing mm-hmm. of your faith produces steadfastness, and let <clears throat> steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, Ken, you said when we were talking just a bit before we got on the program that that in some ways you feel that the the theology of James, if you will, is very primitive. Talk about that. I thought that was interesting. Well, you were asking me the question, um, why is it that the book of James is not as popular as the letters of Paul, for instance? And one reason, at least, that popped into my mind was that when you read the book of James, it, you're very aware that you're reading what seems to be very early uh, primitive Christian writing, and that is that it reads almost like the book of Proverbs or or the Sermon on the Mount. It's it's very practical and, and in that sense, simple, making practical applications to various areas of life, the way we use our tongue, the way we live, the way we do this and that, the way we treat other people. And so... Um, especially as Protestants, I think there's a tendency to want to jump into what we feel is more developed New Testament theology. You know, you know, Paul's writings, you know, the mystery revealed to Paul that Jew and Gentile now make up this church, the wall's been torn down. What about the law? What about justification? So that that's one of the reasons why I think that it's, um, you know, um, it gets sh- short shrift, as they say. When you look at a book, uh 
a, a book like First Clement, which is a letter that was written, many consider at the same time as the New Testament books, but or at least a little later, mm-hmm. depending on whether you think Clement was written when Clement was Pope, which would have been in the 90s, or whether, whether it was written when he was a presbyter in Rome, which might have been in the 60s or 70s. Mm-hmm. But uh, the point is, when you look at James, or excuse me, you look at Clement, um, from beginning to end, Clement, it's like one long Bible study, but of the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. The scriptures mm-hmm. for these earliest crip- Christians, the scriptures were not the letters of Paul, the letters of Peter, the letters mm-hmm. of John. The scriptures were the Psalms, the Proverbs, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. prophecies, uh, the histories. That's mm-hmm. what they knew. That's what they had grown up with. So when a first century preacher like James is speaking to his newly converted Jew, Jews who've become Christians, he's going to build on what they know, mm-hmm. which is the Psalms, the Proverbs. Uh, even we also recognize that the Old Testament, they wouldn't have called it that then, but the um, scriptures that they would have had and heard mm-hmm. would most likely have been from the Septuagint. That was the common Bible of that period, the Greek Bible, the Septuagint mm-hmm. Bible, mm-hmm. which the reason I make that emphasis would have included those books that later the Protestants would remove from mm-hmm. the scriptures, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which would include, for example, the book of Sirach, which I'm going to refer to in just a moment. Because I do believe that there's a verse in Sirach that they may have remembered, as well as, for example, um, a, a a verse from Psalm 51, which they may have mm-hmm. had. They memorized it because that was their part of their worship. Yeah, in, in fact, I don't remember the exact percentage, but something like 90% of the quotations in the New Testament or the Old Testament are clearly quotations from the Septuagint, um, word which, for again word. Is, yep. which again was the Greek translation. After, uh, just very quickly, after um, uh, Alexander, uh, the, the name was slipping my mind, after Alexander of Macedon, Alexander the Great, after he raged through that entire world and the, you know, creating the Greek empire, the language and the culture of the Greeks was spread everywhere. And so outside the actual land of Palestine, almost all Jews, uh, Greek was their first language. Yeah. And, um, and even within the land of Palestine, everybody knew Greek. So, but go ahead. No, so very good. So, so let's jump into this and, and look at that very first verse, which I, I quoted when we opened the program. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials. Now, now listen to that verse. Count it all joy when you meet various trials. And I mean, it almost seems like an oxymoron that uh, it's a strange statement. In fact, Ken, it isn't a statement, it's a command. Mm-hmm. Because the word count it or consider it is or consider is in the imperative form. Mm-hmm. So James is commanding these Jewish Christians to accept the trials they are going through as joy, not just with joy, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it is joy. The, the, mm-hmm. You know, an equivalence. And that's crazy because it's, it's like he should say, count it all joy when you don't meet trials <laughs> yeah, or when you can avoid them or when they avoid you or when you've gotten through them and you've survived. Yeah. And we're going to be asking the question in a moment. Let's hold off the question of why, why James would say such a thing and what the, you know, what, what his logic is in it. But yeah, just, just, just focusing on that here you have, a great saint of God. Again, James was known as James the Just later on in tradition, um, as being either the first or quickly the follow-up first first or second bishop of Jerusalem. 
He was referred to as camel knees because he was known to spend so much time in prayer. And he was martyred in the year 62, 63, something like that. So here you have a great saint, the leader of the Jewish Christian movement, the church in Jerusalem, but the movement at large, the leader of it. And he begins his his letter. This is what strikes me. He begins his letter by introducing himself. I'm a servant, a doulos, a slave. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then just right out of the chute, no, you know, it's good to be here with you. You know, I'm, you know, hi, hi, my name is Marcus Grodi. I'll be your host. You know, there's nothing like that. It's just right out of the chute. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of various kinds. And, and, and as you said, it's, it, it's oxymoronic. It seems like the opposite. Um, count it all joy. It, it was Why? Think, I was thinking, Ken, you know, in the old day, uh, there were some of our more fundamentalist brothers in the past that the way they would a pastor would choose what he's going to preach on next Sunday is he just opened his Bible and drop his finger and mm-hmm. whatever it landed on, that's what God was telling him to, to preach on. All right. Or, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really lousy right now. I need a message from the Lord. So I'll open my Bible and drop my finger and, and mm-hmm. whatever it says. Well, you can almost envision, you know, I'm going through various trials, you know, everything's going wrong in my life. My job is, it looks like it's on the rocks. My kids want nothing to do with the faith anymore. My wife uh, doesn't yells at me all the time. Or what am I going to do? I need some hope. I need some hope. So I I, I open the book. I drop my finger, and it says, "Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials." Well, let me drop my finger somewhere else. You know? <laughs> yeah, and then I'm thinking about I'm thinking about some other forms of um, of, of Christianity, some other forms of Protestantism that teach. That if you are enduring trials, then it's your fault. Yeah. It's, be, it's because you don't have faith. And therefore, they wouldn't want a verse like this either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're Okay. Oh, boy. Um, so there are two things in this, just to get right off the bat. The phrase, count it, is an imperative. It's a command. Say James, right, yeah. is, it, it, he's telling us this is something you must choose to do, to recognize, choose to recognize that those trials are a source of joy. You choose it. Number two, when you meet various trials, the word meet, it can also be translated as you fall into. It's a mm-hmm. sub, a subjective. So mm-hmm. as you said, you didn't do it to yourself. Mm-hmm. We've mm-hmm. met these. They've come into our life. So, in that sense, it isn't my fault. This is the things that have come in, and we're mm-hmm. called to accept them <clears throat> as joy. And it seems to me, first of all, um, we, well, Ken, in our culture today, you can't turn on the television or look at some social media when somebody isn't talking about how to find happiness. You could make a long list of all the criteria that people are are using to bring happiness into their life. Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee you that 90% of those are all about avoiding trials, all about avoiding (laughs) problems. Mm -hmm. I did not have problems as opposed to looking at straight on. In fact, if you will, our entire industrialized medical system is all about avoiding pain. It's all about avoiding mm-hmm. suffering. The worst thing that could happen to us from a secular standpoint is death. From a Christian standpoint, that isn't the worst thing that could happen. To us. <laughs> it, it, it involves an, a different way of looking at mm-hmm. trials in life, looking at suffering, looking even at death differently. And that's why he begins, this whole thing, guys, is about joy. It's about experiencing joy. And I believe that behind this is not just the Old Testament references to joy, but our Lord talked about joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In in a very familiar passage in John 15, we all know the passage. We've heard it a bazillion times about, I am the vine, you are the branches, Mm -hmm. abide in me. If you don't abide in me, the the limbs get cut off, all that. And after Mm -hmm. he's told all of that, about abiding in him, abiding in his love, abiding in the fruit. 
in the end, in verse 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may mm-hmm. be in you, and that your joy may be full. And so, if you will, the criteria for the joy that Christ wants us to have involves abiding in him, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. staying in mm-hmm. him, remaining, continuing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to see in a moment that there's another word for that, right, mm-hmm. Ken? It's called being mm-hmm. steadfast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so as you were saying, this is a, in way of almost a primitive early ca- uh, Christian theology based almost directly on the Sermon on the Mount, on mm-hmm. the Proverbs, all the background, and how do you apply it into their lives? Um, let me say one other thing, Ken, is that the word for trials— Um, can sometimes be translated temptations. And as I mentioned, a a verse from Sirach, which I think really applies here, and Ken, I'm going to quote it, and I want you to talk about it, because I think it's a verse that we need to remember and recognize so much in our world today, is Sirach 2.1, in which he says, My son, if you come forward to serve the Lord, Prepare yourself for temptations. Mm. Mm. And the word temptations in Sirach is the same Greek word Mm -hmm. that James uses here for trial. We think about our bishops and our priests or anyone Mm -hmm. that follows the Lord. They need to know that they're going to meet various trials. Yeah, I I, am... What this lets us know, too, is it it lets us know the fact that James begins here. um, It lets us know that he's dealing with a people who are facing trials. That's what he's got uppermost in his his mind. As we mentioned last week when we were talking about the recipients of this letter, Marcus, um, these are most probably uh, Jews who came into Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and were part of that original, that first sermon of Peter standing up and preaching, the ones who said, the ones who were cut to the heart and said, what must we do? And he said, repent, be baptized. Um, Also, Jewish Christians that were scattered after the persecutions began in the city of Jerusalem. So these are basically pretty new Christians who came to faith and 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 have gone home. So they're dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. And they're facing trials um, from their Jewish brethren who reject them outright, um, from pagans around about. So they're facing trials, and we can see that immediately. Now, our trials are, it's funny, I, I thought at first, well, our trials are very different. They're some of the things you listed, trials with family, yep. trials with children. But no, I mean, it, you try going to your place of work and opening up your mouth and start talking about what you believe. And, you know, or go on social media and start talking about what you believe. And I think that we would realize very, very quickly that it's the same for us. We're scattered. We're like, we're like those who are dispersed abroad too, scattered throughout this basically pagan culture and um, facing trials of various kinds. Not just the persecution though, but the things that come into our lives, as you said. And so, you know, the command is so clear, counted joy when you face these. And obviously, the mind lunges forward. It wants to ask the question, why? Why? And and uh, I, I, maybe we're waxing far too eloquently on this, Ken, but I think the point is that if, if James were writing a letter today to Christians today in the world that we have today, mm-hmm. I think this is exactly where he would need to begin because we can be very discouraged today. And I know Catholics that are very discouraged Mm -hmm. about what they see happening in the church. Um, And you and I, and you and I know that there are even non-Catholic Christians looking at the church that are backing away a bit and discouraged about what they see happening. And if you add to that, what's happening in the world, I mean, crazy toxic brew. Uh, So, yeah. So if okay. if you can imagine somebody hearing verse 2 that we just read and saying, what are you talking about? 
the, the first thing James would say, and it's in the parenthesis in mm-hmm. my Bible. It's a little footnote in the bottom. It says, just, 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 just hang with me here a bit. <laughs> That's what James is saying. I'll just, just hang with me. I'll explain it as we mm-hmm. go. How do you count it all joy? Just hold with me here. That's what James is saying. So that's why we move on and ask, okay, why? And verse 3, he says, which is an interesting take on on verse (coughs) 2. And that is, he says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So in in that sense, he's reminding them Mm -hmm. that, there's the reason that we need to count it joy when we face trials is not really a new thing, especially if you've read the Old Testament. If you've read, if you listen mm-hmm. to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if mm-hmm. or 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 what, um, especially uh, you've seen what the uh, the family of God has gone through for the two thousand mm-hmm. years or four leading up to that. Uh, you know that the testing, and it's interesting that the word for the test, test. Go ahead, Ken. No, go ahead. Go the, ahead. The word for the word testing in verse three. You might wonder if it's the same as the word before trials, mm-hmm. and it really isn't. It's a different word mm-hmm. that means the uh, the proving of the authenticity of your faith. The, the knowing that it's true, uh, the knowing that your faith is trustworthy. So in some ways, it's not so much about my ability to believe is what, what's not really what's being testing. It's, it, it's what I have given my life to, this faith, my faith, the, you know, the faith that we have uh, dedicated our life to these Jews have given up their past to become Mm -hmm. Christians. What Gentiles have given up their pagan to become Christians. It's, is this true? Is this faith of ours true? And you know that the proof of your, the proving of your faith, when you become more convinced that what I believe is true, Mm -hmm. that produces Steadfastness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You become more steadfast. Yeah. So, so, uh, okay. So, the, so the facing of trials. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Okay. The fact that it produces steadfastness in you tells me that it has to have to. It has to be dealing with the idea of your faith being strengthened. Not simply revealed, but strengthened. It's somehow it's strengthening your faith and making you more steadfast as you're forced to believe during trials. The illustration that can, that, that comes to my mind when I look at this right away is I don't know about you, but I've joined gyms a, a number of times in my life. Okay, I've joined <laughs> gyms and I go there all excited, right? I'm all revved up. I'm ready to go. And then the discouraging thing is when you when it dawns on you that in order to increase your strength you actually have to lift things that are hard to lift <laughs> you know you can't just you can't just go there and lift things that are easy to lift if you lift things that are easy to lift you have more fun at the gym but you're not you're not tearing down the muscles you're not building them up you're not becoming stronger okay and and in the same way um, if if the day i came to faith in christ if my life from that day forward was nothing but being, you know, carried around on a sedan chair, you know, with all kinds of people dropping grapes into my mouth, you know, and, and giving me goblets full of wine or something, my faith would never be tested. My my trust in Christ would never be tested, and it would never be strengthened, and I would never become more steadfast. I would just be sort of hanging there in a in a limbo. So what I'm thinking is that, you know, even though we know that faith is a theological virtue, we speak of it, and that faith is something that the Spirit of God works within us. You know, um, as usual, God doesn't just drop these miracles into our lives. He involves us, you know, and so faith doesn't just grow because God just drops more faith into my brain, but 
James is saying that it grows through trials. And, and that's the reason we should count them as joy. That's the reason he gives. Count them as joy because there's this tremendous outcome. That is, the testing of your faith produces endurance or steadfastness. What do I you think, think of that? I think of, the, of what they're starting to encounter uh, when this letter is written. Um, James, we believe, is the second bishop of Jerusalem because the first bishop of Jerusalem, also mm-hmm. called James, was martyred. James himself, this second James, the lesser, will be martyred. Peter and John and Paul mm-hmm. will be martyred. Why will they be martyr- martyred? <clears throat> well, because the, the basic statement of the gospel is the is the little phrase, Jesus is Lord. That's that's the essence of the gospel. Mm-hmm. In other words, Jesus is king. This Galilean that died on a cross that his apostles say was resurrected, mm-hmm. that's our faith. And, and not just that we believe that he died and was resurrected, but that he is Lord of the universe and Lord mm-hmm. of my life. Mm-hmm. And so when you're brought before the, the secular or even the religious leaders that say deny that, or the secular leaders that say, no, Caesar is Lord, what is the strength of your faith to boldly allow yourself to mm-hmm. die? Mm-hmm. And when you read the stories of the martyrs, you read the story of, of Polycarp, uh, who was martyred, uh, who would have been alive at the time that James is writing, mm-hmm. um, as a very young man, but the joy that they have there was because they knew that at the other side of the falling of that axe mm-hmm. was union with Christ, which is why Paul would say later, I don't know whether I'd rather live or die, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. to die is to be with Jesus. And to live, I'm here, but to die is to be with Jesus. And so I don't know which I'd rather be. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the my point is, there are two aspects of the testing of your faith. There's one, do you have the gumption, the strength, mm-hmm. the steadfastness to stand there? But the other aspect of is, is the growing in the conviction, the proving, the testing of it, mm-hmm. that it's true. Mm-hmm. So in other words, it's both the will to hang in there but it's also the deep, heartfelt conviction that this is true. And and those two are connected, obviously, because if you believe that it's true, uh uh-oh, I got a grandson here. Hello. You got to go out of the room now. I'm doing something, okay? Hi. (laughs) Shut the door, Jody. Thank you. Um, Yeah, you know, I mean, okay, God comes to Noah and he says, no, I'm going to send a flood on the earth. Okay, if Noah believes that it's true, he'll he'll get down to, you know, Lowe's and start buying the lumber. He'll start doing the work, right? So, I mean, these things are connected, what you're saying. On the one hand, the depth of knowing that it's true, and then to the extent that I know it's true, then I'm willing to stand when the trial comes, um, even if it means being martyred. And in that process... Faith itself grows, faith itself strengthens, and we become more steadfast. And the verse, I mean, I think behind this whole discussion, we got to think about Hebrews chapter 12, where the author says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. So even even Jesus is depicted as enduring the cross because of what because of what he sees ahead, yeah. the outcome. And and there's the mystery of the of the person of Jesus, because sometimes we, we, we overshadow his humanity with his divinity and miss the fact that it's important for us to recognize that in his humanity, he really did have to obey. You yeah. know, he was steadfast. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. I think of another place in Scripture when, in John 6, 
when you got all his apostles and all these people mm -hmm. following Jesus everywhere, mm -hmm. loving what he's doing, they want to make him king because he's feeding everybody, he's healing everybody. Hey, this is just dandy. Everybody, hey, this is great. Wow, wow, we're having a good old time. You know, and then, and then Jesus stands up and says, well, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, mm -hmm. you have no life within you. And they're saying, what? And then he says it six other ways. Mm -hmm. You know, he who eats my bed abides in me. And, and, and then the crowds begin to disperse. Everybody's leaving. They're not very steadfast. They're not very steadfast. They're all gone. And uh, in fact, someone says, why are you leaving? He says, well, that's pretty hard stuff. That's hard stuff. So they leave. And there's 12 guys left. And Jesus says, well, what about you guys? <laughs> and the truth is that nobody in that group spoke up. Except one guy. What was his name? Peter. His name was Peter. Peter. And what did he say? Lord, to whom shall we go? And there's it's a sense in that when it, it isn't a real bold statement. I mean, Peter's kind of saying, what do we do? Where do we go? We've, bec we've come to believe uh -huh. and to know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And to me, that, that, that movement from believing to knowing is involved here in the testing of our faith that produces our willingness not to leave. Mm -hmm. Because it's both yeah. the strength, as you said, the theological virtue by grace of being able to believe, but it's, it's a deeper deepening of our conviction that it's true. We look at the elements on the table at Mass, and we say, that is the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus. <clears throat> and I believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it. And I see people receiving it like it's nothing more than a cracker and juice. But I believe it to be true. And sometimes it's the very testing of it by seeing around us people abusing it mm -hmm. that tests our faith. But there are times when, because of that testing, we have an awakening to realize even deeper that it is indeed true, which is why I believe it. Mm -hmm. So it's that that mixture mm -hmm. of the proving of its truth that produces this steadfastness. You know, I, I referred to Hebrews chapter 12 a moment ago, but that whole section, beginning with Hebrews chapter 11, that's what it's all about. You know, we refer to Hebrews 11 as the, you know, the, the uh, oh, right. uh, what's it called? You know, the, the hall of fame of faith. But you remember how it concludes. It concludes with those who are, who were killed and covered in animals' clothing, those who were sawn into through faith, through faith, through faith. And, you know, James is just another perfect example of that. Through faith, he endured even to being martyred. And, of course, we yeah. face trials of different kinds, um, not exactly the same trials, all kinds of trials. But ju just to sort of land on the, the bottom line point again, yep. what James is saying to me here and saying to all of us is that, we should. We're commanded to count it joy when we when we face trials of various kinds, and there's a reason for it. And not because we're masochists, not because we just love pain or anything like that. It's it's because we can know that the testing of our faith will produce endurance in us. This is our path forward, and we're going to get to the word perfection pretty soon. Right. But lacking in nothing and perfection. But this is our path forward, and so. So we have a reason for counting it joy. We have a reason. I was thinking about in the Psalms, which they would have known. They would have known by heart, these Jewish people, from the time they were young, they would have memorized the Psalms because that was their prayer. And very often, if you will, there are times when the psalmist admits that he struggles with faith. God, where are you? Lord, where are you? In fact, the very psalm which our Lord quotes from the cross, um, Father, Father, why hast thou abandoned me? He, when, when our Lord says that from the cross, that isn't so much an expression of his doubt, but he's, he's quoting one of the most famous Psalm, Psalm 22, mm -hmm. that, that uh, predicts the crucifixion. That's why he's quoting mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. 
he's showing, showing the fact that sometimes we feel we're in the midst of crises, we're in the midst of trial. Where are you, God? The point of this is when you're in that trial, there's a sense in which that's the proof that he's here. <laughs> because the reason you're going through this is to draw you closer to him. Because he yeah, loves that, you as a father. The reason for this trial. Mm-hmm. Can you see it? This is what he's saying. Can you see it? Push oh, yeah. aside all the junk. And can you see that mm-hmm. the reason for this trial is because he loves you? That's the point. Yeah, and what, what you're saying there, uh, uh, it reminds me, St. Jose Maria Escriva, the founder of Opus Day, he used to say, if he didn't have any trials in his life, he would look up and say, Lord, don't you love me? <laughs> You know, that's what you just said. You just said, you know, it's yeah. a, it's the proof that he loves us. Uh, and, Which is and what James is. Grow, and wants us to grow, wants us to be stretched, wants us, wants our faith. Anyway, but that's all of that, all th- of that. That's really what James is about in, in this issue of perseverance. Um, Ken, I think you've, you've <clears throat> recently written a five or six uh, article uh, uh, tome on Luther and justification and faith and works, and it's available on our website. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it is interesting that what he also says here in this verse <laughs> is, you know, people think that James and Paul and Romans and the book of James are at mm-hmm. each other's throats, whether it's faith alone or faith is sufficient or whether faith with works. And and what James is saying here that... Um, whether it's faith alone or faith and works, there's a third and most important thing, and that is our need to remain with Christ, mm-hmm. to 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 be steadfast. To that's necessary John on the 15. road to salvation. John fifteen: If you abide in me, abide in me, you will bear much fruit. If you keep my that's a passage where he also says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in me. Um, yeah. But so, steadfastness. So the steadfastness, the hanging with it, the, the importance of, um, if you will, James is written, we live in the age, the new, if you will, I hate to use the word new age because it's, it's referred to so many things, but the new age that came with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the devil was uh-huh. defeated, and now we're in the age of the church, the, the age that's referred to in the book of Revelations, we're in the millennium, uh-huh. that's the way that the Catholic Church uh-huh. always in St. Paul understood. We're in that time. And if you will, James is written at the beginning of that time. All the news at the beginning. So here we, we're, we're going uh-huh. on to this big journey, folks, of, of lordship of Jesus Christ. He now reigns. We're in his kingdom and all of that. And the <clears throat> point is that as we live in this age, we are going to face trial, and it's a call to persevere. And moving into verse 4, all that we said there, He says, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So talk about, yes, steadfastness, which is our ability to stand firm on what we believe in the face of whatever trials come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he is saying here that, that the full effect of that is necessary for salvation. Yeah, for us to become complete, for us to become perfect, lacking in nothing. And and I'm going to want to apply that to Sola Scriptura in a moment, in a a moment. But but first, you know, just the practical issues of life, because trials come to us in all kinds of shapes, all kinds of sizes. I want to read you something that's kind of funny, um, because this is very practical. This applies to everything. Um, St. John of the Cross he wrote a letter to a sister in the Carmelite convent at one point who had written to him and was complaining about another sister in the convent and how difficult it was to live with her. <laughs> listen to what listen to what St. John of the Cross wrote back to this to this to this sister. You should understand that you have come to the convent only in order that others may polish and exercise you. Thus it is fitting that you should think that all are in the convent to test you as they truly are, that some have to polish you by words, others by works, others by thoughts against you, and that in all these things you must be subject to them as the statue is subject to the artist who sculpts it and the painting to the painter. If you do not observe this, you will never conquer your own sensuality. 
nor will you ever attain holy peace. And probably one of the prime examples of my own life, when I came to Christ, it was a honeymoon period, and it was all joy, and there was no trials, no tribulations. I remember as a young man, Marcus, riding along on my bicycle and memorizing Psalms and memorizing books of the New Testament, and I'd just be reciting them to myself, and life just seemed perfect. Now, I scroll forward about 20 years to when I came to the conclusion that I had to resign my ministry as a Baptist pastor. It was in, it was in September of 96, and you, you know what? At that same time, okay, my mother died in February of 96. I left the ministry in September of 96 and began sinking into debt, living on credit cards, um, I remember meeting with some Catholic men uh, for a prayer meeting during that time. And I remember looking at them, Marcus, and I was telling them about how difficult it was and how I was trying to find a job and I didn't know what I was going to do. And, and my hand was actually shaking like a guy, you know, with, a, with, with Parkinson's or something. And I looked across the table and no kidding, I looked across the table and in the eyes of these four men, I could see that they were looking at someone that they were gen genuinely afraid of. They thought that I was the kind of guy that was about, uh, not afraid that I was going to attack them, but afraid that they were looking at a guy that was kind of uh, uh, emotionally collapsing. Um, my father then died the very next year. So I had my mother die, my father die, lose the ministry, lose my income, lose my sense of identity as a pastor. And, and I have to say, maybe this will benefit some people li listening to this, that I did not rise to the occasion like James in his martyrdom. I did not. When I look back on it now, you know, I, I did not stand strong. In many, many ways, I didn't stand strong. In many ways, I kind of fell apart. And I went through some months of very, very difficult time in which this passage doesn't apply to me. I mean, I did not count it joy. I didn't see what God was doing. I, 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 didn't, I didn't do it. I'm not a success story. Well, in, in, in this, I, I'm guessing that uh, along with what you've said, I'm guessing that an awful lot of us speaking or listening have not been very good success stories at this. Um, I, I don't have the data in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that there, the, the book of Job was not a book that was a real popular Old Testament book for a lot of Protestant scholars, teachers, preachers. Because of the theology of suffering? Because of the theology yeah, of yeah. suffering. But it was a very popular book in the early church fathers. And the truth is that the book of the reason book of Job is in the Bible mm -hmm. is not because it's a story about some guy that lived 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, or because it's just a a parable about a guy that supposedly mm -hmm. lived for the, the book of Job is about every single one of us. It is about us. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the word various trials, you notice that he didn't say when you meet trials, he threw in this word yeah. various. Yeah. And the truth <clears throat> is that we bring many of the trials that we face every day onto ourselves because we aren't really living according to the mm -hmm. gospel that our Lord gave us. We, the, if, when you look at the gospel of the Sermon on the Mount, that is the backdrop to this book, it, he calls about <coughs> simplicity. He calls us to live not uh, lusting after wealth and things and property and things of this world. Our heart isn't to be here— mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. as he talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about simplicity. He talks about seeking the kingdom, not about what we can fill our barns with. He says in verse 34 of Matthew 6, Do not be anxious about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Let tomorrow be anxious about itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. Most of the stuff we worry about is stuff that's past that we can't do anything about anymore, forget about it, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. stuff that's going to happen tomorrow, we can't do anything about that. It's just mm -hmm. today, just today. We bring our, you know, all the stuff onto ourselves. And Ken, if you had memorized James 1, verse 2. 2 through 4. 
<laughs> and 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 had it to heart when you were going through all that stuff, you might have faced it differently. And I'm not pointing any fingers. Same here. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's kind of like, I mean, back to my gym analogy, even if I know that I have to lift weights that are hard to lift to get strong, you know, yeah, sometimes you go in there and you 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 put the weights on the thing and you can't lift it. And, or you, you know, in this case, in the case that I'm describing from my own life, I mean, there, there's a lot that could be said about it, but the bottom line is I'm just saying that if I had had, I wish I'd had this in my mind and I wish I had prayed more during that time, I think. I think rather than getting nervous and just becoming active, trying to find a job, trying to, you know, trying to fix problems, if I had spent more time with the Lord in prayer and meditating on this kind of stuff, I'm just saying, I think I could have faced the whole thing better than I did. I don't think that I was much of a success story during that time. But, you know, you're right. The the uh, We bring a lot of trials on ourselves. Um, maybe that's not an example of it. I mean, you and I both brought trials on ourselves by resigning our ministries and having to start over, but that wasn't in a bad way. But, you know, um, any man that goes on the internet and starts looking at porn, he's bringing trial on himself. He's bringing troubles on himself. And there are many other ways, like you said, becoming nervous about life, not trusting in the Lord. And then there are the trials that, as you mentioned at the beginning, that kind of come to us that just fall into our lives. You know, mm -hmm. the death of a loved one, losing your job, all, all you know, cancer, all of these kinds of things that we have to jump up and trust. Or it could be to someone in our lives, like St. John of the Cross and that letter that he wrote to someone that's driving you insane. And John of the Cross says, John of the Cross tells that nun, he says, basically, the only reason God put you in that convent is to be tested by these other ladies. That's what he says. Yeah, we he sometimes says, think. When one of them has to polish you, one of them has to uh, by their evil thoughts against you, one of them has to polish you by their works against you, but you're like a statue. Uh, go ahead. What you an easy saying. life it would be to just go off and leave the world and go into a convent with a bunch of other men or a bunch of other women. And the point is that's the exact opposite because you're yeah, thrown together true. and you got to live with these other people and you can't run away. They're your brothers. That they're You're there for life. So, I mean, it's a very challenging life for them to learn this very thing. This is what we're, this is it. The, what James is talking about here. The more you reflect on mm -hmm. it, I'm, I'm telling you, this is the core of the gospel. Because the faith that we have received by grace mm -hmm. needs to grow and needs to be tested. Mm -hmm. And we need to see in those trials Jesus. Because when he's there, the reason he's there is so that we can persevere, be more convinced that what we believe is true and give us strength to continue believing so that now we jump way ahead so that that perseverance has its full effect. And between that steadfastness and then the, the end, the full effect, if you will, there's a lot that goes in there. And, you know, the, the whole books of Paul mm -hmm. are in that gap. The whole sermon is in that gap between <clears throat> faith and steadfastness and the full effect. That's our life. And, and it might be five years, 10 years, 50 years, it might be one day, but it's that full effect so that in the end of that, when we stand before God, complete. is perfection and complete, lacking in mm -hmm. nothing. And it seems to me, Ken, that <clears throat> behind those words, perfect and complete, are other scriptures where those ideas come out. Right. Uh, uh, yes, I don't want to. I don't want to derail your your no, line, no, no. line Go of ahead, thought. Go ahead, my friend. So by, well, well, then, okay. A slight theological excursus. Yes. Because because as we discussed two week, two weeks ago, I think probably the primary passage the Protestant apologists and Protestant pastors and whatnot will appeal to for the idea that Scripture is all we need. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Listen to the words because of the comparison. All scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, amen, for correction, amen, for training in righteousness, amen, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, that passage is continually used to say Scripture is all we need, and the reason we know that it's all we need, we don't need tradition of the church, and we don't need any magisterium, we don't need that. 
And the reason we know that scripture is all we need is that Paul says, in order that we may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so the apologist will say, hey, look, if scripture can make us complete, if scripture can, can equip us for every good work, then nothing else is needed. Well, one of the passages I like to turn to is this one we're looking at, because here James says, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so I just like to ask the question, well, well is James then teaching that all we need is faith? That we don't need the Bible? Um, to be perfect, yeah. lacking in nothing. Okay, we don't need the Bible, apparently. Uh, we don't need prayer. Um, we don't need anybody to teach us. We don't need teaching. Um, we don't need, I mean, you can go ahead and list them all, yeah. right? We don't need, so all we need, uh, let's say, as a way of saying, I mean, as a way of simply saying that, look, drawing that conclusion from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is, is illegitimate. You're drawing more from the passage than Paul intends. Paul, what Paul intends to say is, look, Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable. That's a key word for teaching, reproof, so that you will be everything God wants you to be. But you know what? At the same time, hey, we need the testing of our faith. This produces steadfastness. And once this has its full effect over time, as you and I, Marcus, wrestle through trial after trial after trial, and in the process, we learn to trust God more and more, we learn to believe more and more that this really is true. We become more and more steadfast. The full effect comes and we become complete. This is the whole process of sanctification being summarized without using the word. Yeah, and I, I want to be careful that I don't caricature Father Martin Luther, but how I understood it both growing up as a Lutheran and then later mm -hmm. is that he had a real personal problem with perfection and how he understood our Lord's statement, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that was such a personal devastation to Martin Luther that he, in essence, came up with a way around it, that mm -hmm. all I need is faith in Christ. And when I put my faith in Christ, the perfection that I receive is not mine. Mm -hmm. It's his that covers me. So in essence, blinds God from my imperfections so that I remain imperfect until I die. But I'm covered with the perfection of Christ. I'm justified before God so that when I stand before God, <clears throat> and he says, as James Kennedy said in his evangelization explosion uh, program, <laughs> Why? Why should I let you into my heaven? <laughs> why should I let you into my heaven? What, excuse me, but why should I let you in? And the answer was to point away from yourself to Jesus, mm -hmm. because he's my Savior, because I put my faith in him, and I, it's his merits. It's his righteousness. And then the answer is, okay, then enter in my kingdom. But but that ain't— is what, he, is he in, But there's—yeah— the, the subtleties here, because those words are true. It is true that it's Christ's death and resurrection. It is true that it's what he has done. But what we mean by that, though, is not simply snow covering a dunghill, as you said, blinding God to who we really are, but the whole story of God making us progressively into the back, I mean, in a sense, remolding us into the image in which we were created. So that when we stand before him, we're perfect inside and out, right? Right. And, and it, yes. it seems to me that if Paul was believing what so many say Paul believed, then when it came to the issue of being perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, and someone would have said, okay, yeah. Paul, how are you doing with that? Are you perfect yet? Are yeah, you complete? Yeah. His answer would have been, well, that's not important. I have my faith in Jesus. He would have pointed no, to Jesus. Yeah. No, you're you're exactly right. I I would think that what he would say, I, I guess we'll have to look at his commentary on James if there is one. I don't think there is, but yeah, I think he would look at this 
that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, I think you would have to say, whoa, whoa, hold on. In myself, I'm going to be pure dung for the rest of my life. I'm going to be sinful inside and out. Every thought I have is sinful. Everything I do is sinful. I am nothing but sin. So in order for me to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, no, uh, yeah, he would not see this as a process by which, I mean, I don't, maybe Luther would. I don't want to talk about Luther because well, I, I don't I'm talking to, about Paul. Yeah, yeah, well, well, I'm talking about someone. Well, I know, I know, no, 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 no. We're, we're, yeah. we're, we're saying the same thing, but, but. Yeah, I'm saying, okay, whoever, the, this person that focuses on justification by faith alone, they would have to say, no, 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 no. I'm only perfect in Christ. Christ's righteousness has been legally imputed and credited to me. That is my perfection. Whereas it's very clear that James is talking about us being made complete through this process of trusting Christ through trials. So yeah, this is talking about sanctification. So let me jump in here then, my friend, because right? you know what you just said is what many would say Paul would have said. Hey, you know, I don't, it's not me. I don't want to be imperfect as Jesus. Yeah. Well, what did Paul say in Philippians 3? This is what Paul right. answered to that very question. I mean, it's a long answer, but listen to what Paul said. He said, for his <clears throat> sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteous of my own based on law, but that which is through through faith in uh-huh. Christ, the uh-huh. righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, that kind of sounds like what Paul yeah. said, but let me keep going. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, <laughs> mm-hmm. becoming like him in his death, that if possible, I may attain mm-hmm. the resurrection from the dead. But now here's the key verse. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make mm-hmm. it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brethren, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to mm. what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, see now, Marcus, this language press on this it wouldn't make any sense at all if what paul has in mind i mean if the righteousness or the perfection paul has in mind is always the righteousness of jesus legally credited to my account like snow covering a dunghill it's this, it's it's perfectly obvious that paul is talking about a perfection that is being worked in him right yeah Yep. yep. What Paul just summarized was this. Now, here's another word for what Paul said. What Paul was saying is that, count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing (laughs) of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's what Paul said. He's saying the same thing as James. He's, He's saying, saying the same thing. Now, there's something oh, my. Im- there's something important about the phrase lacking in nothing. And what hits me there is that becoming completely perfect by grace does not only mean eliminating imperfections or the, the, mm. the dunghill, but it means acquiring all that is necessary. Mm-hmm. It means detachment as well as growing in virtue and fruit. Yeah, yeah. The way, the way I think of it sometimes is, okay, we were created, Genesis chapter 1, created in the image and likeness of God, if you will, created to be finite mirrors, perfectly reflecting the character of God, the nature of God, the being of God, okay? Sin has distorted that image. Sin has, you know, sin has turned us into funhouse mirrors in a sense where, you know how you go into the funhouse and the mirror is all crazy and you yeah. stand there <laughs> and, and it looks like you, but it looks like you all warped out and distorted, either stretched out or shrunk down or something like that. That's kind of one way in which you can look at sin, you know, meaning that the image of God is still there. The image of God is still present in me, but it's all, it's all distorted and out of whack. 
And so the process of sanctification in Christ, what Paul's talking about in Philippians 3, what James is talking about here in chapter 1, could be summarized or could be summarized as saying he is mold, he is remolding us back into the perfect image of Christ, the image in which we were created, the image and likeness of God. And, and so you're right. It's not just a matter of the filth being cleaned out, but it's a matter of all the virtues being formed. Yeah. Um, the negative wiped away and the virtues being formed. But the thing that is that is really stunning, the reason I'm smiling well, is that is that it's so obvious that he's talking about a process. Yeah. And it's so obvious that Paul in Philippians 3, that's a great passage, yeah. was talking about a process. He wasn't talking about a justification in just a legal declarative sense, you know, on my account now I'm pure and God's, God is blinded. You know, God sees me in Christ as perfect. He's not talking about that. He's talking about a real change in us and a real process that brings about that change. Otherwise, talking about process does, doesn't make any sense. I don't need a process to be declared righteous in Christ, and I don't need to press on, as Paul says two or three times in that great path. I don't need to press on to be declared righteous in Christ. I just, uh, like Luther said, I just have to look to Christ in yeah. faith, and, and even, the work is done. And even he said in, in verse, Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 11, that if possible, mm -hmm. I may attain the resurrection from the dead. If possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, not this yeah, arrogant yeah. presumption yeah. of the one saved, always saved. It's a humility. So here we are, we've been saved by grace through baptism and faith. We are new creations in the Lord. Original sin has been wiped clean, but we're still that goofy image in that bent mirror mm -hmm. of, the, of the fair. And so our Lord wants us to grow in perfection. And so how does he do that? He puts in front of us a trial. Do we run away? Or do we see in that trial the work of God trying to make us perfect? And so by grace, it's not, it's not just us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. facing that trial. He gives us the grace. That's the point of grace, yeah. so that we can face that trial, trusting mm -hmm. in him to take us through it. And we don't know, as you were saying earlier, Ken, what is on the other side of that trial. <clears throat> we don't know what's over there. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus says, don't worry about that. You've got enough trials right now. Face those with me. He says in yes. Matthew 11, come to me, you, those, you, you who are weak and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. It's a partnership with Jesus. Well, look, you know, I'm going crazy thinking about passages in the Bible now. If I may, let me read one more that just popped into my head. A after hearing Philippians 3, listening to James here, listen to this passage now with, with ears tuned by James 1 and Philippians 3. After Hebrews chapter 11, and all these stories of by faith so-and-so did this, by faith so-and-so did that, by faith, by faith. Listen, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews chapter 12, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood." I mean, he goes on from there, but I mean, again, he's yeah. obviously talking about a real race run in this life that has to do with casting off sin, trusting in Christ, looking forward to the joy that is set before us after the trials, when it's all over, the joy, the perfection, being complete in him. He's not talking about the legal imputation of righteousness. He's talking about us being transformed. And he uses all the same language. We don't want to become faint-hearted. We want to fight the fight. We want to run the race. We want to make it to the end. And isn't that what Paul says at the end of his life? I have fought the fight. Yep. I mean, you know, Paul doesn't say at the end, hey, you know what? I've held on to the fact that Christ's righteousness is, is mine, and that's all I need. I'm sinful to the core, but Christ's righteousness is mine. 
said he says, I've, I fought the fight. I've run the race. I, I'm going to throw a, uh, this is totally speculation, my friends, but uh, the hist- throughout the history of the church, for the longest time, for the mass majority of the history of the church, it was the assumption of biblical scholars that Paul wrote Hebrews. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's only been really in the last hundred or so years that people were con- just didn't take Paul as the as right. the writer of Hebrews, though from the beginning there were some doubt. But but the other thing is that when you read the book of Hebrews, you don't find any of the any mention of that whole circumcision stuff mm-hmm. that you find in Galatians and Romans. Mm-hmm. And so my speculation is that it's possible that this may have been the first letter that Paul wrote before the council, just like James was written before the council, to the same group of people. Because because Paul mm-hmm. isn't yet <clears throat> Paul isn't yet aware, awakened to the focus of his mission to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He's speaking just like James to Jewish Christians. And my point is, that's why I think reading James and Hebrews side by side, you see Mm -hmm. James and Paul side by side with a more primitive understanding of the faith based on the Sermon on the Mount. And in Hebrews, Paul's trying to help the Jews understand their whole whole liturgical sacrificial system. Mm -hmm in relationship to Jesus, the high priest. So I just I put that in there because to me that fascinates it. But let's bring, I'm going to close with one thought, one okay. story. And in the recent readings of the Office of Readings, uh, one of the readings was a, a letter by St. Jerome Emiliani. And he is he was the founder of the Order of Samashka, uh, he lived in the fifth, early 1500s during the time of great plague and famine in Italy. Uh, it was during that time that he sacrificed himself, if you will, to help the poor, help widows, help orphans. He came through that. Um, he started a hospital, and then he started this order of priests. And I'm not sure if there are nuns, too, probably, to help orphans, widows, and the poor. Um and in 1535, he wrote this letter to his religious brothers. And Ken, I'm going to let you fill in the rest of the story. What is He, he lived in the very northern section of Italy on the border with Switzerland, less than 15 miles from Geneva. Mm. And he wrote this letter in 1535. Why is that significant? Well, during that time, John Calvin himself was virtually the king of Geneva. Um, Yeah, the heart and soul of the Reformation, the greatest theologian, really, a systematic theologian more than Luther was of the Reformation, who wrote his great four-volume Institutes of the Christian Religion. So uh, so Calvin is reigning over over the Reformation in Geneva, 15 miles from this from this from, gentleman. Okay? And so he's he's writing to his brothers in this mission mm-hmm. in this little town in northern Italy helping the poor. They've been through the plague. The the the, the church is dividing all around them because of the reformation. Mm-hmm. In Switzerland, you got Bucer and Zwingli are right up mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. up the road. And mm-hmm. so he writes this letter. And here's what he says. Now this is about 1500 years after James. He says, I urge you to persevere in your love for Christ and your faithful observance of the law of Christ. God wishes to test you like gold in the furnace. The dross is consumed by the fire, but the pure gold remains in its value increases. It is in this manner that God acts with his good servant, who puts his hope in him and remains unshaken in times of distress. God raises him up, and in return for the things he has left out of love for God, he repays him a hundredfold in this life with eternal life hereafter. This is the way God has dealt with all of his saints. If then you remain constant in faith and in the face of trial, the Lord will give you peace and rest for a time in this world, 
and forever in the next. Well, it's a wonderful passage. Wow. Wonderful. I mean, that's what James is trying to mm-hmm. tell us, and it applies today, too. How can we see in the trials of this day the hand of Jesus? That's the point of this passage. It's a good question. That's great. Yeah, All right, everybody. It's beautiful. We're going to pick up next week. We will look at next week. Up through verse 12, I think. Maybe. I was thinking 5 through 8 if we're lucky. Okay, well, we'll see. We'll, 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 we'll tell. Let's prepare through 12. <laughs> but as I looked at it, we'll just see. We okay. make it. Yeah, there's lots we'll of good stuff in here, Ken. Yeah. Right, look forward to it next all right. week. Thank you all for joining us. I hope this program has been an encouragement to you. We'd love to hear your comments and your questions if you go to the online community at chnetwork.org. God bless you all. We'll see you next week. Deep in Scripture is a production of the Coming Home Network International. To hear more episodes, view our full archive of written and video conversion stories, participate in our online community forum, and more, visit chnetwork.org. You're also invited to explore free membership in the Coming Home Network, and receive support on your own Catholic journey. Again, visit chnetwork.org for more information.